Um, could you please tell us a bit more about Plan A and your mm -hmm. role at Marks and Spencer? Back in 2007, Marks and Spencer recognised that, that the whole cumulative impact of environmental and social expectation of the business was changing, and we had to get away ahead of the curve. So traditionally, lots of businesses like us manage risk. You know, we wanted to make sure there were the wrong pesticides in our food, the fish coming, coming from a good source, the forest work being chopped down. But it was very back of house. It's just making sure that individual bad things didn't happen. In 2007, we said we had to do things differently. We needed a collective, ambitious plan to drive fundamentally better social and environmental performance at Marks and Spencer. So we launched Plan A because there is no Plan B for the one planet we've got, covering every social and environmental issue that we face. Energy use, water use, soil management, human rights, fats and salts in food, packaging, everything was in scope, bold targets through to 2012 at the time. We delivered those, we've kept updating Plan A over the last decade. So in total, we've done 297 different improvements to the business. We failed another 21, again, very transparently and honestly, we've learned lessons from that. We won 240 awards, which were all nice. But at best, Plan A to date has helped make Marks and Spence maybe 20, 25% sustainable. There is so much more to be done. Right, so good afternoon, Mike. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time to talk to us. So I'm here today to talk to Mike Berry, Director of uh, Sustainable Businesses at Marks and Spencer, if I said it correctly. You did. Um, it's a very impressive title, I have to say. Um, and first of all, we've asked all our contributors, mm. what does innovation mean to you? Well, innovation is the lifeblood of, of any business. It's this ceaseless attention to servicing customer need, which never stands still. Customer need is constantly evolving. And the business that stand still are the ones that die. And you must keep innovating. So innovating is not just a function for a business. It's an emotional commitment to continue and improve and change. And that requires you to be looking outside constantly, learning, bringing new ideas into the business. Not just big ideas, but small ideas as well. You can innovate on a pipe or a pump. You can innovate on a ready meal. Or you can innovate on a suit. Or you can innovate on your whole business model. And I think one of the things we'll discuss today is just how much business model innovation will be important in the next decade. We all need to fundamentally change how we operate as businesses. So I think you already kind of asked, uh, answered my next question, which would be why innovating? Why is it so important? Mm. If you can grab just one sure. thing, what would it be? Well, innovation has been a lifeblood, I think, for many businesses, for Marks and Benz, for, for decades. I mean, what's different now is the sheer scale of innovation, the sheer scale of pressures we need to respond to. And I'll just characterise them in, in three very quick buckets. There's an economic challenge in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, the proverbial artificial intelligence, robots, sensors, driverless cars, amazing opportunity to do things differently economically. But also, we need to decide to use those new technologies in the right way for society and environment as well. So there's a whole degree of disruption about economics. Secondly, the environment. Uh, you know, we live in a world of 7 billion people moving towards 10 billion, a billion middle-class consumers moving to, towards 4 billion. There literally aren't enough fish in the sea for all of us to live and consume as we do here in the West today. We need to find a dramatically different way of interacting with nature as business. And then there's a third great challenge, which is the role of business in society. You know, people asking questions about human rights, about privacy, about tax, about gender, about commitments to diversity. And again, we need to utterly disrupt the old way of doing things and bring all that together. So economically, socially, environmentally, there's a great series of disruptions that face into us. You can be daunted by them or you can be excited by them. And that's what we are. And that's what we're trying to drive forward, a way of satisfying consumer need in a totally different way in the future. Um, what roles do you see, what role innovation would play in your next commitment plan towards 2025? What would be the role of innovation? And mm -hmm. by your own admission, there are some commitments that you're not really sure about how sure. you're going to achieve. So what would be the, innovation, the role of innovation in terms of achieving those goals? It's a great question because in practice, Plan A has felt difficult the last 10 years. It's, you know, it's stretched us, it's, it's challenged us. But in practice, we were just plucking the low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff. If we look out of the next decade to come, there's some really hard changes that we need to make, very profound changes. And just to name a few, I mean, we have to find a radically different way of interacting with plastic. You know, there's literally too much plastic in the environment. We, like many businesses, have been used lots of plastic for good reasons. It's cheap, it's easy to use, it delivers great functional um, benefits. When it can be captured and recycled, that's great, but often it can't. And again, I think we've all become a little bit hooked on plastic. To de-hook ourselves and find different ways forward that are actually better, not just PR, but fundamentally better for planet and people, we're going to have to really stretch ourselves. 
diet. You know, there's more and more questions being asked about a meat-based diet. 260 million tons of meat eaten around the planet today, each year. That's going to double over the next 20, 30 years, with huge impact, again, on forests, on land, on human health, animal welfare. We need a profoundly different way of providing protein to people that's not like today's. Alcohol, sugar, again, profound challenges for the industry. As we think about an NHS and council healthcare, that can't keep up with all the challenges it faces today. And again, government will increasingly look to business to carry the burden of, of dealing with those problems. So again, looking ahead in plan A, we've done the ease of it. We now see some really profound changes in terms of what we do. And that takes you to business model innovation. This is the point at which just tackling individual issues changes. Do you need to sell circular clothing in the future? You literally take back all the clothing you sell, bring it back, reuse it in terms of fibre, uh, which is great environmentally. Hundreds of thousands of tonnes of fibre avoiding landfill. Great economically, because customers keep coming back and participating with you as well. And again, great challenge on the food, food side. If you think what we've done for many decades, like all food retailers, we've sold food products. We've sold wine and ready meals and apples and oranges and coffee and tea. And that won't stop. But your business model in the future will be increasingly about the personalisation of health. People will come into our shops demanding very personalised food for them. So rather than turning out a million lasagnas each week for customers that are exactly the same, increasingly we're personalising to what individual customers need. Now today that's very scary. How do you possibly contemplate the scientific challenge, the engineering challenge, the economic challenge and the trust challenge of doing that? And yet we have to find a way because if we don't, somebody else will do. And that's why innovation is so important for us to do. I mean, um, obviously there were two themes that stood out. One is the human angle and the health and sustainability mm. angle and the other bit is the environment. How do you create a balance? There's so much demand for innovation and how do you decide where priorities would be? You do, um, you make a lot of commitments and then mm. who makes that call? Mm. So again, you need to look at commitments in, in two ways. One of the, are those that are very connected with your customer. So we've made three big overarching goals, say, out to 2025 now with Plan A, to help 10 million people live happier and healthier lives. The issue of well-being is enormously important to our 32 million customers. So we're going to put well-being at the very heart of our business, our offer in the future. Secondly, is to help a thousand communities around the UK where we're placed. And we know we've gone through great disruption there. It's the rise of digital retailing comes in. The ability just to have physical shops in the same place as we've had for 100 years, we can't carry on. We need to shift. And we've already announced the city that we will be shifting Marks and Spencer stores, closing some, sadly. It's always awful when you have to leave a community, but if you don't, you will wither and you'll disappear as a business. But the thousand communities that Marks and Spencer remains in, we need to be fundamentally part of their world, helping them to a much greater extent than we do today. Marks and Spencer is a useful business today. We create job opportunities for those, for those people that might have disability, been homeless, we volunteer, we fundraise in the community. It's a good start, it's not enough. And then the third great opportunity with customers is become a truly zero waste business. Again, going in part back to the issue of plastic. But every single thing that Marks and Spencer does in its supply chain, its operations, and the products and packaging it sells to its customers must very soon become zero waste and must always have a second, third, fourth life going forward. Those are big, profound goals that will touch all our customers and everything we do. But of course, behind the scenes, there's always issues that we have to innovate on that the customer never sees. Supply chain issues, factory issues, farm issues, that the customer might, might not be asking for, but if you're to be a credible business with a purpose and a passion to be trusted, you need to be dealing with. And if you don't, the media, social media, NGOs, campaign groups will trip you up and show you wanting. You cannot afford just to focus on one thing that's nice and forward looking. You need to make sure that everything behind the scenes is connected as well. So all these things you're achieving and um, I know for a fact you're not achieving these things alone. You're collaborating mm. with a lot of other organisations such as Oxfam and WWF. Mm. Um, why did you see the need to collaborate in these areas and where do you feel innovation helped you the most and collaboration yeah. helped you the most? You've achieved much more mm. by collaborating with these organisations mm. rather than going on this journey on your own. So collaboration is vital to become a sustainable organisation. In part because we are just part of a wider ecosystem. Marks and Spencer is a tiny fraction of the UK economy, UK society. We can't possibly hope that our business will be zero waste unless the whole of the rest of the industry, of councils and recyclers line up and agree with us. That's the best way forward. So if Marks and Spencer picks one plastic to bag, and we'll only use that one in our business because it's easy to recycle, you need everybody else to be doing that as well. 
and that's your competitors as well as other organisations. So you must be both a collaborator and a competitor in the marketplace in the future. We do great work with uh, NGOs, people like Oxfam, the WWF, Moon Conservation Society, name but a few. Again, that brings new ideas and challenging. We're retailers, we've got a worldview, we see things, I think we can try and think broadly, but you can't see everything. So the more challenge and different view you bring to your organisation, more resilient and diverse it is. So again, innovation can only be done these days in partnership. Now, of course, we're always trying to win in the marketplace. There'll always be things that we seek to do first and foremost ourselves. But more and more, we'll only become a true sustainable business and a sustainable society and economy if everybody around us moves in the same direction as well. And practically, how do you make this sort of collaboration work? So how do you choose your mm. partners? What's the process of selection? Mm. How do you prioritise things around uh, collaboration? So to me, there are two types of collaboration. One is that whole sector change. And we do work very closely with something called the Consumer Goods Forum. It brings together all the world's food and drink companies, the Coca-Colas, the Pepsis, the Walmarts, the Tesco's, uh, the Unilever's, the Nestle's, the m and and so on. huge competitors but very clear on certain sustainability issues such as deforestation, food waste, local on refrigeration. None of us can solve those issues alone. Even Walmart, 25 times bigger than Marks and Spencer's. So we need to be very humble there. And CGF works really well because it's led by chief executives. As hard as I work with my opposite numbers as chief sustainability officers, it's not enough. You need the chief execs of these world's biggest companies turning over $3 trillion a year between them to say, we must change. And I empower you, my team, to make it happen. So that works very well on the huge scale. You drive the change across the entire marketplace, thousands of companies and suppliers. And then there's more one-on-one -on -one collaborations where you probably want a little bit more of a point of difference, a little bit ahead of the marketplace, where you're not trying to bring your competitors into the tent, but you're working with other external organisations. great example is what we did with Oxfam, something called Schwapping. We sell over 300 million items of clothing a year. We don't want that to go to waste. We want to recycle it. We could bring it back to our shops. It's a little bit messy when you're selling new stuff and it's meeting old stuff going coming back in. So we encourage our customers to go take their clothing to 750 Oxfam charity shops around the UK. It's really easy to get to on most of the high streets that we are. They're providing a service in the network to M&S to collect clothing back that we don't necessarily want to do ourselves. They then get to sell that clothing and raise £2 million extra a year for their vital overseas development work. So you can do that whole sector collaboration one-on-one -on -one collaboration as well, but either approach is vital to the success. Do you have an example of a um, collaborative project that you're particularly proud of, apart from the uh, uh, you uh, just mentioned? So I would, uh, I would probably mention the CGF and the um, Oxfam one. Let, let me just think of a different one. Um, I can give an example of um, one we've literally just launched. So one of the uh, collaborations, the great collaborations we put together, very, very proud, was something m has led on cotton. We're one of the world's biggest commercial cotton users around the world. We know that cotton it might look a natural fibre, but in practice it's got huge social and environmental footprint. Soil damage, pesticides, fertilisers, water use, poverty amongst, amongst farmers. We need to change that industry. But again, m and buys a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1% of the world's demand. So we need to work with others. So we've built a collaboration of now 30 companies, and it will soon be 40 or 50 companies, who use cotton around the world to come together to say, together we want to change the world of cotton. Now, we could have been a passive member of that collaboration, just waiting for somebody else to do it. But we've taken the lead. We worked through our chief exec to convene all these other businesses, brought them together to sign up to a commitment to 100% sustainable cotton use by 2025. So m is both a leader in galvanizing the collaboration but to collaborate in terms of working together on everybody else. And part of that leadership is clearly to be ahead of, of, in terms of delivery of the actual target. So whereas the wider industry might get there by 2025, we'll be there by 2019, working with others, but showing leadership within that as well. That's very impressive um, and very, very good to hear. Um, I think we're getting to the end of our interview. Mm. Um, you launched Plan A in 2007, so it's 10, 11 years mm. in by now. So I, I guess you had a lot of success and failure mm. on your journey. If you could just have one message for our viewers today to take away, um, what did you learn? What was your biggest learning? What's your biggest message around innovation? So two, two immediate thoughts for anybody watching this. 
First is integration. We've got a good small team in the middle of Martin Spencer, 10 of us working on sustainability full time out of 86,000 folk. But in practice, we need the people to buy the food, buy the clothing, run the lorries, run the shops, do their job sustainably as well. So we've really focused hard at making sure that we haven't got a big team on the edge of the business doing CSR on behalf of the business. We're integrating sustainability in terms of what everybody does. And that's great in terms of innovation because these people are close to the marketplace now. They see solutions of, for the customer that people want to buy that I can never imagine here in the centre. So integration is key. The second is, is boldness. Again, if we'd all would said it each year, Marks and Spencer wants to reduce its energy use by 2%, of course we would have delivered that. It never has stretched us. We've never have failed it, but we've never have stretched us. And by stretching ourselves, we've come up with some really exciting leaps in terms of making MS a better business. More trusted, more purposeful for our employee, more resilient in terms of climate disruption, more prepared for these radical disruptions in terms of new products and services in the future. So integrate and stretch yourself as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure.